it looks like you're packaging an, almost all of your applications into rules. Is that correctly? Like I saw, for example, you showed the, the NNR and DPAT and stuff like that. So what you're, it sounds like what you're doing is what a lot of people call recipes. You're actually building an underlying application, then packaging that as a rule that a person can configure the way they want to. Correct. You're sort of moving everything in that direction uh, towards rules, that, or a lot of stuff, not everything. Well, we've been doing a lot with rules uh, in recent years, and yes, we found it's a, very, it's a very coherent platform, right? Once an engineer understands the concept of a rule, if you think about it, a GPAT rule is not very different from a yield monitoring rule. Uh, it's different possibly in the actions it performs, but basically, yes, it's the same fundamental capability. The stuff we'll be talking about next year when we're, when we're presenting this is we'll show you uh, a much more flexible capability in the rules to actually be able to build your own types of rules as well, rules with complex, complex flows and relations between them. Uh, that'll all be coming next year. For the rules where you change the binning for the adaptive test, does your software include a type of sign-off loop where you can assign different users to approve that change so one user doesn't just go in and change it and then you start binning out a bunch or to prevent mistakes? We do have a whole set of roles in the system that determine which users are allowed to perform which kinds of changes. Obviously, most users can't go in there and make changes which could suddenly kill 90% of your yield. That wouldn't be very, uh, uh, very advantageous. So yes, there are roles and, uh, and, and uh, regulations. Plus, uh, when we perform publication of rules, the system can be configured so that the subcon receiving that rule actually has to approve it before it goes into production. And then there will typically be an approval process where it gets validated against one particular lot uh, to ensure that it's behaving correctly and so on, and then they'll, uh, uh, they'll actually enable that across the production floor. Um, we didn't, we, it's difficult to demonstrate on a single laptop, but what we can actually do in addition to that is we can show statuses very clearly. So for example, if you've got a rule, let's say you're a large organization, you've got 10, 15, 20 test floors out there, and you've published a rule to all 20 of them, you can actually see and monitor the status at each of those individual test floors and know exactly what's happening, where it has been enabled, where it hasn't been enabled, and so on, and control that uh, with a very fine level. Uh, full approval uh, flows, we don't yet have workflow, but we're going to be integrating with workflow systems to do that as well. Uh, yeah. uh, I saw a lot of uh, analysis use, probably is based on the binning from uh, production test. So for the development stage, most of the time we will look at the parameter itself, like the readings, how much is the current, like 10 micron, 20 micron uh, is uh, also for some tests, let's say the memory test, we look at how many fail it have, maybe 20 or 5,000 or something. H how much you can do about this? Uh, we data? can do a lot of that today already. Um, we, we didn't have it in this demonstration, but it's something we've shown in previous years. Uh, there's a, a, uh, one of the data sources we have here in OT Portal is uh, the failing test uh, data source, which can actually tell you how many tests failed, how many times, and so on. More than that, you can actually use the test time reduction um, analytical tool uh, to really analyze in detail how many times each test is failing, which combinations of tests are failing, uh, and things like that. Um, next, in Q2, to Q2 or Q3 of next year, we'll be introducing a characterization engineering solution as well uh, to start helping even more in that direction, but that's, uh, that's future. You had a rule that you mentioned about checking a test program, and it sounds like it checked the number of tests if it varies between one test program rev versus another. Is there also a way to check, say, other attributes of the test program, such as voltage and frequency changes between test program revisions? Um, not at the moment. Not at the moment. With the new, uh, with the new uh, rule language that we'll be coming up with next year, that probably would be possible. Uh, we don't have a specific rule that does that. Um, another rule, though, that would be, I think, very interesting and similar to what you're talking about is what we call the test program checksum rule. Uh, we can actually check or detect situations where someone's made a change, either inadvertently or deliberately, to a production test program uh, and alert on that as well. Okay, yeah, that, uh, from a yield point, yield engineering point, that is very interesting to me. Yeah, so... And then uh, the, the second question is, you mentioned your looking into int um, introducing design attributes into OT. Uh, what are some of the things that you're eventually moving with incorporating the design? Uh, that's a very good question. In fact, it's something I forgot to mention. Uh, so thank you. Um, we're working at the moment with Synopsys. Uh, we're going to be uh, introducing a capability very similar to our export to jump capability, or our active link, uh, our live link to jump that uh, we demonstrated last year. 
uh, you're going to have a live link to uh, to the ADA uh, to some to, for example, Yield Explorer for Synopsis, and uh, we'll probably be doing similar things with other uh, vendors as well. But it goes much deeper than that. Uh, what, what we're trying to do there, and it's a project we're working in with a joint customer. Um, is we will be able to set up rules that can trigger collection of diagnostic data on the tester based on, for example, particular parametric test signatures or bin results or whatever. So you know, when the tester then goes and retests that particular part, we can automatically trigger diagnostic data collection. We'll use our data um, uh, highway uh, effectively to bring that data into uh, and store that in our server. And then when you get the alarm from that uh, email, you'll be able to click through and directly get into uh, Yield Explorer, in the case of Synopsys, and bring up that diagnostic data. So you, know, you can be, uh, again, driving home, uh, putting your kids to bed, I don't know, going out for a run in the morning. When you get to work uh, and a problem occurred during the night, you have all the data that you need to actually go and deal with it. Yeah, I was uh, wondering if this could be applied to a higher level assembly printed circuit board with several FPGAs on it, uh, you know, checking AOI, flying probe, boundary scan tests, functional tests, system tests, that those is kind an, of things. Uh, an, another excellent question. Um, yes, we're going to be moving in that direction very significantly. Uh, we already have uh, been in talks with a design partner, a very large electronics firm, uh, about exactly how we could implement those kinds of capabilities. It's not yet available because uh, there are many things in electronics which are more complex than a chip test. For example, I've got a board, it's got five chips on it, right? It failed in test, I can just switch out one of those chips and put in another one. Uh, so we, you need to maintain the traceability and the tracking of all of the parts on that particular board. And of course, boards contain sub uh, motherboards, daughter boards, and so on. It gets more complicated. But yes, optimal tests will be moving in that direction, and we'll be providing solutions for that market. Um, question regarding uh, test time: When OT reports a test time, what exactly is it? Is it uh, say in a scenario where we are doing a multi-site testing? 16 sites. Is it the test time that is reported by the tester, the test in the data log, or OT calculates by itself? Uh, that's also a very good question. And the answer is, uh, for the last three years, it changed about four times until eventually we got the message and we just left it flexible. So actually, you can define your own measures that calculate it different ways. So we've got some situations where customers are saying, take the example you gave, testing uh, 16 sites in parallel, okay? Only if all 16 sites returned a result and all of those results were good, will I include that touchdown in, uh, in my average calculation. Other customers will tell you no. Even if only, let's say, 10 of those sites were in use but all of them were good, I want you to include that touchdown in the calculation. And others will say, no, I want you to take the data from the start of test to the start of the next unit, in other words, including the indexing time. Uh, today, you have the flexibility, really, in, by using uh, what we call uh, custom fields, the ability to create uh, functions. You can actually create your own field that would represent any of those combinations. Hi. Uh, I have two questions. First is on getting the uh, data into your OT database. Are you basically relying on the STDF format or other tester-specific data format? Um, we don't run on the STDF format. We have our own format, which we call OTDF, which is being generated by OT proxy server. Uh, based on the data, and that gives us something that, uh, it actually gives us several things which are significantly lacking in SDF from our perspective. I would say that all of the customers that we deal with still collect their SDF files for a variety of reasons, uh, but that's in addition to the OTDF file that we uh, generate. Uh, the OTDF contains all of the information about, um, about adaptive test or any process that we ran on that wafer or lot while it was running, so it's a much wider uh, data set from that perspective. Um, and it also guarantees consistency, right? What, we, what you'll very often see if you look at uh, SDDF files generated even for the same product but running at two different test houses, you'll see fundamental differences in, for example, the content of the master information record in that SDDF file uh, and other layout issues in the, in the file, which make it very difficult to correlate data uh, coming from different, uh, different sites or across different products, uh, different product groups and so on in the organization. And what we've done with the OTDF is we've tried to, to uh, substantially improve the standardization of the data in the data log file uh, so, that we can, uh, so that we can really correlate the data properly. Now, for some of the uh, test processes that we're talking about, for example, e-test or SLT, 
Uh, those test processes, we can't write proxies for that equipment uh, because they're either extremely non-standard or, uh, or for other reasons. And for those purposes, for, from those processes, we can load data log files such as STDF files or any other data logs. We've got uh, loaders that support a very wide variety of formats. Uh, but in our typical deployment, we will uh, strongly recommend that to use the OTDF format. Also, take into account that, as we were talking before, you know, STDF files, uh, again, Craig was talking about it, and we've heard it from every customer we've ever dealt with. STDF files take hours, sometimes days, sometimes even more uh, to arrive. An OTDF file is going to be back at the design center within five or 10 minutes of end of test, and that is critical in being able to use the tool to actually impact your production and not discover things way after they, you know, they're no longer relevant. Okay, so the second question is you mentioned that you have a binning switching, yeah. where you have a, a previous good band, you can flag it to be a bad band. So basically, that's to me, it sounds to me you're, it's kind of like you're changing a spec limit outside the scope of test program, right? Uh, no, so, it's not uh, happening on the tester or during the test program. Uh, the test program completes running with its spec limits, and it sets the bin to a good bin, right? And that's the data that uh, ends up in the data log. Okay, as a post-process, uh, once the wafer is already off the chuck, it's been unloaded from the wafer, and it's about to be shipped to, to assembly, the test house send us the wafer map, right? The digital wafer map, the inkless wafer map that represents that wafer, and that's where we make the changes. So we're not impacting or interacting with the test program in order to perform bin switching at wafer sort. Now, in final test, you can't do that, because in final test, once a part is tested, Okay, it gets placed in a good tray, and it's there with all the other parts. You've got no way of separating the good parts from the bad parts. So for, for final tests, we're working currently on solutions that will enable real-time bin switching, where we will do exactly what you're su suggesting. So effectively, we'll be interacting through some API with the test program in a very similar way to the way we're working with the Drift project that, uh, that Craig described. Uh, we'll be interacting with the test program to actually perform the bin switch in real-time and make sure that trip goes straight to the bad tray. So I actually have a two follow-up question on that. Is first is like, have you seen a pushback from customers where have specific requirements on the uh, test program? You have well-documented test programs and spec limit bindings are fixed in test program, especially for automotive customers. Uh, like if you have a rule change, basically I, I was thinking it uh, kind of like you're releasing a new test program. Is that a problem to the automotive customers in that regard? Uh, quite well. It, 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 yes, it's an issue that needs to be dealt with, but it's actually, as I described in, in one of my first slides, uh, one of the drivers for this change is the automotive uh, industry. Right? They're the people who are demanding this additional quality. And uh, um, most of the automotive uh, products that you see out there today already run some kind of outlier detection or part average test uh, rule which would do something very similar to our bin switching solution. What we're taking is we're taking that to the next level, and we're adding a whole load of deterministic rules which prevent additional bad parts from shipping. Right? So the, uh, the customers we're working with uh, who have requested and demanded and are working with us uh, on these rules are working on, in the automotive industry. And yes, they are having conversations with their customers about the, impl the implications of the implementation, uh, but that is actually the, target, the, the, the primary target audience. Okay, well, thank you very, very much.